Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I want to read uh, Acts chapter uh, 18, uh, starting at verse 5. When Silas and Timothy were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and he said unto them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. And from henceforth, I will go unto the Gentiles. And it goes on to say that he departed uh, and entered into a certain man's house named Justice. Uh, one that worshiped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, that's the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid but speak and hold not thy peace for i am with thee and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee listen for i have much people in this city and he continued there a year and six months 18 months teaching the word of god among them I pointed this out in a, in a past video. So when Paul goes to Corinth, he is not trying to get anybody to become God's people. He knows that they already are God's people. He knows that they already belong to God. Paul's responsibility is not to make some attempt to make them God's people. They are God's people. His responsibility is to preach truth, to feed them, because they're God's people. You know, it's, it's interesting. As we look at the illustration that God used in the, His Word, uh, we're born again by the Word of God. We are born again by the Spirit of God. And we know what birth is. We didn't have any decision in our birth. We played no part in our physical birth. We had nothing to do with it. It was all up to the, the parents. Our spiritual birth, as, just as, as, as well, our spiritual birth is entirely up to God. As he writes to these Corinthians, he says that they have already been set apart in Christ Jesus. If you started this study with us and you read through chapter one with us, you've seen that they've come behind in no spiritual grace. He says that they have the grace of God. He says that they have been enriched in the teaching. These are the people at Corinth. And here we are in the third chapter now. And in the third chapter, he says that when I came to you, and that's back there in chapter 18. Paul, don't be afraid. Be encouraged. I have many people in that city. They're my people. They're going to heaven. Whether you go to Corinth or you don't go to Corinth, they're going to heaven. Whether you preach or not, they are going to heaven because they are my people. And whether they believe or not, they're my people. Not one of you could rightly believe that, it, that in, in any way, God would be unfaithful to his own people. Therefore, if we're to be consistent with this book, if we're to be consistent with Scripture, we have to conclude, we are forced to conclude, 
that the only people that God is concerned about, or you or I ought to be concerned about, and I know this is going to get me in trouble, are those who are God's people. And that's what Paul says. I came... And I, but I couldn't preach to you as spiritual people because you didn't know that yet. You didn't know that yet. You still look like that you were made out of flesh. You are spiritual people. You are God's children. You're not going to be born again by anything that you do. You're born again by the will of God, by the Word of God, by the Spirit of God. That's already been done. My point is, the, the question is, you know, when are, are you Corinthians going to believe it? You know, there are many people, especially nowadays, who say that, that Paul was converted on the road to Damascus. And I don't have any problem at all with that. But that does not mean that that's when Paul became a child of God. He was separated from his mother's womb, and he was carefully, meticulously trained to be used of God to write what God inspired him to write. He was always, always God's child. He just didn't come to know that until on the road to Damascus. Same with you. Same with me. So Paul fed them. He fed them as people who looked like that they were made out of flesh. But in actual fact, they were spiritual people. They just looked like that they were made out of flesh. So he fed them. He fed them spiritual food. Now you can read any number of commentaries out there. There's a lot of them. You know, milk is simple truth. Meat is profound truth. That's the general cons consensus among most Bible scholars today. Uh, many and many a minister preach from that standpoint. You know, I would never preach election. I would never preach predestination. Uh, certainly not double predestination. Or any of those terrible, serious doctrines of Scripture. I would only preach simple truth. But Paul says that when he came to Corinth, he preached the Word of God. I preached for 18 months. I preached to you the Word of God. So it isn't that he refused to deal with biblical doctrine. It's the way that he did it. The way that you treat an infant. And as I pointed out in our last study, these are babes in Christ. What better place could they be? In what better place could they be? They're not only babes in Christ. They're set apart in Christ. They're enriched. We saw all of this in chapter 1. They've received every spiritual grace. Just like Ephesians reminded us, we've, received, we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. And they are participants in the grace of God and the love of God. They're His babies. And they're in Christ. And now he's back. Paul is back after three or four years since he was there. I don't know how much growth that there was. You know, we're going we're gonna to look at that in a moment. And now I can't speak to you any differently than I did three or four, three and a half, four years ago, because you're still carnal. But as I pointed out in my last video... 
he used a different word. He now uses a word that says you're still acting like your flesh. He's admitting in the text that they're not uh, flesh, that, but, they, but that they are spiritual. They are God's spiritual people, but they're acting like just what they were before. Yeah, we're going to read that it was God. It is God that's, that's causing the growth. Now, you can conclude from that, and everybody, it seems like everybody does, that there was no growth. So there, there couldn't possibly have been any growth. There certainly wasn't any growth going on in that time in which Paul was absent. But that doesn't seem to jive with the first chapter. It says they were enriched, they were blessed, but it looks like that there was no growth. You people are still acting like your flesh. You aren't flesh, but you're acting like your flesh. Because there's envy, says the text. There's strife. There's division. Acting like flesh and walking like men. Now, are we to suggest... Are we to suggest that strife and divisions are not present where believers get together? That that I don't think that there's anything too uncommon about that. And I, I would guess that you don't think that either. It's evident because one says, I'm of Paul, and we're down to where we were in my last video. Now, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Apollo. Now, he doesn't mention Cephas in this case. But he will later. If you really are saying that, isn't that an indication that you're acting like flesh? You're acting like a human, or you're acting like mere men. You're acting like flesh, but you are not flesh. Because as I pointed out, it's a different word. You're not flesh. You're acting that way. After all, who is Paul and who is Apollo? They are simply servants by whom you believe. They were God's people. And only God's people could believe, can believe. My sheep hear my voice. So only sheep hear God's voice. If they're not already his sheep, they can't hear and those are the much people that he has in that city, according to what we read in Acts. They are servants by whom you believe as the Lord gave to every man. Verse 5. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? Note every man. That, that's, that includes more than just Paul and Apollos and Cephas and so on. Verse 6. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Who caused the growth? God. Well, was there any growth? Paul says... I can't speak to you as unto spiritual. You're still carnal. You're still acting like you're carnal. You know, I don't see any change after four years. So, what increase did God give? Uh, let, me, let me add to your confusion here just a bit. Would there be any increase at all if God hadn't given it? Or are you going to suggest to me that he didn't give enough? You know, and, and there are thousands, I'd say probably thousands upon thousands of sermons preached on how God is blaming these Corinthians for not growing. They're fleshly people. They haven't grown as they should. 
You know, Paul is criticizing them here. God, the Holy Spirit, through Paul, is lambasting his people here. He's strongly criticizing them for not being what they ought to be. Dearly beloved, please listen. But if he's doing that, he's casting aspersions on the growth that God caused. It is God who causes the increase. God who causes the growth. And folks, I cannot do that. Now, I get criticized a lot, always have, for stressing the sovereignty of God too much. Actually, I don't think I stress it enough. If it isn't in the verse or in the passage of Scripture, then please let me know. Write me, email me, text message me, call, do something. Let me know. I don't want to stress it if it isn't there. I'm not going to sit around trying to figure out what problems there are in y'all, all of y'all's lives out there and then search the Bible for text to deal with that in a sermon telling you how that you ought to clean up your life, straighten up your life, clean up the old man so that you'll grow. My Bible says that Paul and Apollo had nothing to do with their growth. Dearly beloved, please listen. I can't make it anything but a statement of fact that God caused them to grow. That's what my Bible says. I am positive that that's what your Bible says. God caused the growth. He caused the increase. And I am persuaded that by far the majority of so-called Christian churches today are feeding people something that is not nourishing. And it has to be it has to be God that causes the growth because they're not feeding them anything that would cause growth. I, I have to stop at verse 6 and say that these Corinthians, four years later, three and a half, four years later, are exactly where God intended that they be. And I admit that that is contrary to every interpretation that at least I can find on this passage of Scripture that says in so many words that they should have been further along in their spiritual growth. You know, shouldn't be jealousy. You know, there shouldn't be strife. There shouldn't be divisions. Well, of course there shouldn't. But there was. They're there. My Bible tells me that God says there must be divisions in order that they who are approved may be made, may become manifest. That's a strong, strong statement. God has, has clearly pointed out that He ordained division. I mean, if, if we all agree, then there's no reason to study. I'll, I'll say this publicly because I've said it privately. I have appreciated so much over the years people disagreeing with me. Now, I don't, I don't want to get a flood. My email, I don't want my email box being flooded with people that disagree with me. But I'm, I'm just telling you that you, you disagree with me and you're going to cause me to study more to, to see if I'm right or if I'm wrong. I don't know what disagreements do to you, but they force me to study. And I'm commanded to study to show myself approved, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I know of one brother whom I've never personally met who has driven me to study more than, than anyone else because of how much he disagrees with me. And most of you are probably afraid to disagree with me. And I think he's probably going to stand before the Lord with a greater reward than mine just because of what he did for me. And that goes for all of you people who make comments to me. There are divisions. 
Okay? There are differences of opinion. There are strifes. You know, it, it looks, and I, it looks, it appears as if, like the text is saying, division, divisions should not be there, but I can't agree with that. I told you how important it is to be consistent with Scripture. I can't say that. I can't agree with that. God said there would be. It's not that there was a time in your life when, when you were in Romans chapter 7, you know, but now you're delivered and now you're in Romans chapter 8. You know, I heard that early on in my Christian life. That's a very popular sermon, but it isn't true. Here's Paul the Apostle saying, that which I would, I do not, and those things which I would not, these I allow. O wretched man that I am. That's, that's Paul. Okay, Paul the Apostle. Oh yeah, Steve, but you know... Uh, you know, that was before he obtained the victory. You know, before he was baptized by the Holy Spirit. No, no, no. That was the strife that Paul was in. It's the battle, the strife that you are in. It's the strife that I am in. Why do you suppose that our Lord said, says, Make not provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts thereof. There is not a single one of you who can stand before the Lord, God Almighty, in a day of accounting and say, well, I never made a provision for my flesh to fulfill its lust. Not a one of you can say that. You can't do that. You will not be able to say that. I mean, you won't even be able to lie and say that if you want to. Many people seem to think that they're sort of a, you know, many churches, well, they think that, well, they're sort of a unique church. You know, we're all high-level Christians. We diligently study this book. We know more than other people. So we don't have strife and division. We don't have envy. We don't have strife, envy, jealousy, and, and we don't make a provision for the flesh. Come on. Come on. The pride that I see among Christians. We are all sinners redeemed because God loves us and, be, and, be, and because God chose us. And sometimes, too often, we get the opinion that we're better than others and we're not. We are not. God my Bible says, gave. I don't believe I'm pushing the text at all. In the Greek, God caused the growth. These people in Corinth grew. And yet they still acted like they were flesh. Are you getting this? Oh, dearly beloved, please listen. I hope you get this. They were growing, yet they still acted like, like they, they were flesh. Who shall deliver me from the body of this flesh? I thank God through Jesus Christ my Lord. So then with my mind, I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So who's Paul? Who's Apollos? God gave the increase. So then since God gives the increase, neither is he that plants anything at all, neither is he that waters, but it is God that causes the growth. God causes you to grow. The grammar confirms that when Paul came to Corinth, growth continued in past time, and now it's still continuing in the present time. They are still growing, yet they're acting like flesh. I hope you get that. You know, minister after minister misses that fabulous truth. When Paul first came to Corinth, he knew that he was speaking to God's people, and Paul came preaching Jesus Christ. He came preaching nothing but Christ and Him crucified. 
He says in Acts that he did. He faithfully preached the word of God. That's Christ. That's what ought to be preached. The word of God. Of God. The word of God is Christ. Christ is the word of God. Not my ideas on, on how you ought to raise your kids, how you ought to clean up your life, how my idea on how you ought to invest your money and, and all of that, you know, so that you can give more to the Lord and all that silly stuff that goes along with that. I'm, I am persuaded that no matter how poorly the Word of God is taught, just as I don't care how poorly the translation is that you're using, God promises that His Holy Spirit will seal truth to our hearts. He'll filter out all the foolishness. The Holy Spirit uses it. The one who plants is nothing. The one who waters is nothing. It is God and God alone who is causing the growth. Okay? And once again, we have a second statement. That there is growth and it is caused by God, not by Paul, not by Apollo, not by Cephas, not by Steve, not by anyone, not by you, not by me, not by anyone, but God. He that plants and he that waters are one, absolute unity. Does that mean that there's absolutely no difference in how they teach? No. No. They are the people that God put there. However, every man, every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Not judgment, reward according to his own labor. Why? Because Paul laid a foundation as a master builder and every man's building on that foundation. But, it's, and it's the only foundation we can build upon. But we are to be careful. We're to take heed on how we build upon it. Verse 9, we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. You're God's building. Okay? That verse 9 there has three genitives. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful verse to translate. The grammar there is clear without going into detail about the genitives. The grammar is clear that we are not laborers together with God. As if there's some synergism involved here. And so, you know, we're both working and God can't work without us. You know, it's difficult for me to say that. That we are not working with God. That God doesn't depend on us to work. But that is the, the fact of the matter. We know that it's God who causes the growth. So it seems funny if, they're, if we're working together with God to cause this growth. You know, it seems funny that that would be the case when other scriptures have clearly indicated that it is God and God alone that causes the growth. Dearly beloved, I, I believe that the text is telling us that we are God's workers, that He owns us, He bought us with a price, keep that in mind, and you know the, what that price was. On the other hand, you're God's field. My Bible says you were God's area of activity. You're His field in which He works, and you are the building which He's building. And since I don't want to run way over too much time like I did in my last video here, I have to ask you, how good a, a job, folks, do you think that God does in His field? And how good a job do you think that God does in building His house? And these aren't the only passages of Scripture that talk about God building the house or building the body or or, or putting the body together. It's God's activity. We aren't doing that. We are those who God owns as His laborers to proclaim His truth. And our present context has said that we fit that truth for the condition of the hearers. I think that's what milk is. I do not believe that milk avoids serious doctrines of the Word of God. It doesn't avoid 
doctrine. Milk doesn't avoid doctrine. It's not something other than doctrine. I think milk indicates that that doctrine is presented in such a way. It's presented in a different way. You don't hide from a child uh, of God the fact that God is sovereign, that he's a God who chooses. But you're more careful, dearly beloved, in how you prepare that food and serve it. You know, it's, it's, it's not a good idea uh, to just shove a whole lot of food down a baby's mouth. You'll probably just spit it up all over you. Paul says that after four years, three or four years, and God causing the growth, they're still not able to eat more solid food. Even though... He tells them that they are absolutely complete in Christ spiritually. You know, spiritually, we don't grow very fast, folks. We don't. We, I think we expect too much out of ourselves, and we expect too much out of one another. We don't grow very fast. I think God would be wrong. You know, and boy, that's a terrible way to say it. God would be wrong to instantaneously not only have us perfect and complete in Christ, but 100% doctrinally mature. Come on. You, you know that's not the, how he does it. Dearly beloved, do you understand how, do you know how wonderful the learning process is? Isn't this text telling us that God in His sovereign majesty feeds us slowly so that we can handle the growth as it comes day after day. That is what I see in the text. I see the slow growth over, over a period of several years in the lives of the Corinthians. I have to take that as true in your life and mine as well. That is evidence of the grace of God that's mentioned in chapter 1. You've received the grace of God. I know my growth's been slow. And I'm certain it's, it's, that's also been true of you. So I'm not sure I want to take this passage as God, Paul, or God lambasting the Christians, giving his church there at Corinth a, a big spanking because, you know, by pointing out their condition. The condition of the flesh will never change. God deals with us patiently as we grow. Dearly beloved, I love you all. Thank you for watching.